garden line, we learn what greenery decorates the yard and attracts songbirds. And these are very attractive and turn bright orange in the fall. Funding for Garden Line is provided in part by your membership and the Friends of South Dakota Public Broadcasting. And by Swiftel Communications. Hello and welcome to Garden Line. I'm Stephen Monk. Tonight on our show, we will visit with an SDSU wildlife expert who will explain why certain trees and shrubs attract songbirds. And as always, our panel of lawn and garden experts are here to answer your questions with the most up-to-date information about gardening, lawn care, insects, trees, and a host of other lawn and garden related concerns. So get ready to call in. The phone number for you to call in is 1-866 595 SDSU. Again, that is 1 866 595 7378. Joining me in the studio to answer your questions is John Keekafer, Brookings County Extension Educator, David Graper, Extension Horticulturalist, Mike Meckney, Extension Weed Specialist, and KC Jensen, SDSU Wildlife and Fishery Sciences. Helping answer the phones tonight are the folks from the Minnehaha Master Gardeners. And remember, when you call in with your questions, please provide the phone volunteers with as much information as possible about your garden problem. Be ready to provide a description of the, of the problem, when the problem first appeared, whether it's affecting any other surrounding plants, and moisture and soil conditions that exist around the plant. First off, we're going to go around the table, though, to hear from our panel on what is currently happening, starting with you, John. I brought in a curiosity this week. I guess that's the best way to describe it. Uh, at this time of year, we start seeing a lot of adult spotted pellet nodids out in, in grape foliage and sometimes flying around lights at night. And these are large beetles. They're in the same family as June beetles. And they're kind of an interesting thing. They're not really a, a problem in this part of the world, but the adults are out feeding on grape foliage and the larvae live in rotting tree stumps and tree roots underground. These are big beetles and many of them are fairly brightly colored. They range in color from kind of a pale yellow to almost a, a rusty brown. In the northern part of their range, like in this area, we see them with uh, six black spots on them and they are a little bit bigger than our June beetles. They're about an inch long. Most people think June beetles are bigger than that, but really these are about an inch long. Like I said, they don't really do any significant damage to grapes out there. They're just feeding a little bit on some of those leaves, not a, a cause for any concern on those grapes, and they certainly won't do any damage that warrants any sort of control on there. If you do find that you've got a huge number of them on there and you're concerned, you could just hand pick them and, and pull them off or you know crush them at that time. And uh, as larvae in those stumps and things, they're actually something of a beneficial insect. They help decompose some of that wood and and break down some of those, those proteins and, and tissues in the soil. Um, one thing I should mention on these with those larvae, these are big white grubs. When people find them, they're surprised by the size of them. These things really will get to an inch and a half long. They make the white grubs you find in your lawn look pretty small by comparison. Uh, we had a stump one time where we found those in. They're almost as big as your small finger in diameter. and They had really pulverized that stump. I was amazed at how they kind of ground it all up. On it. You tend to find them in almost groups in there. You, you rarely find just one in a stump. You'll usually find half a dozen of them, and they're not right together, but they're usually fairly close, and they do a number on those stumps. Okay. Thank you, John. David, what do you have for us tonight? Well, I'm going to talk about daylilies in a moment here, but I did want to also talk a little bit about the heat that we're all getting stressed out by. Uh, it's going to be a stressful time for your plants, too, especially anything newly planted that you might have in your yard. 
The difficulty that we're going to run into is that we want to make sure that plants, that especially newly planted plants, have sufficient water, but we don't have, also have situations where we got too much water, and we can see kind of the same symptoms showing up on both situations. If they're getting too much water, the roots are starved for oxygen, the roots start to die, they can't take up any water, so the plants are going to look wilted. If the plants are, in fact, in dry soil, or the soil around them is dried out with this heat that we're experiencing, they're going to also look wilted. So you need to check that soil before you just assume right away, oh, the plant's wilted, it needs water. Uh, we're going to see wilting, we're going to see leaves turning brown, especially in, the, in between the veins. We'll see browning showing up on plants along the edges of the leaf. We'll see browning showing up. Those are signs of water stress, but you got to, before you just automatically water it, check to see what the, the water, soil and water situation is first. Last week I talked about lilies a little bit, and this week the big show out at McCrory Gardens, the lilies are still doing great, but the daylilies are now in season. And daylilies are probably one of the best perennial plants that we can have here in South Dakota. And I brought a few images along with me from the check out at McCrory this morning of our daylily collection out at McCrory Gardens. And there's really quite a diversity of, of types of lilies here, quite a wide variety of flower colors. Uh, you can see quite a few different varieties here. These can range in height from about a foot and a half on up to about three feet or so with most of the cultivated lilies. When you also get the ditch lilies, as I call them, that you'll see in some people's yards are in fact growing in ditches, and those can be up to four feet tall. Uh, the colors range quite a bit in the yellows and, and uh, uh, orange colors. Those are very common. We also get some of the pinks and almost into the reds. The next image shows another uh, grouping of some plants with more of the lavender kind of flowers. Those are all pretty common. They are called daylilies for a reason. If we look at the next image, we can see that there are multiple flowers on a stem, and one or two or three flowers may open at a time, but they only last for a day, and that's where the daylily flower name comes from. But there's usually many flower buds on a stem, so that flower can be open for quite a wide, a long time period. Here's a, a newer cultivar that we've got out at the gardens, uh, getting some of those reds and two-tone colors in there, getting the little uh, frilling around the edge of the flower. Uh, and I also brought in a few flowers in a vase just to talk about one other aspect of daylilies and that besides the variety of colors we have, and I just grabbed these from my yard at home, these aren't anything special, uh, but I've got two daylilies here around the edge of the vase that I wanted to, to mention. Uh, daylilies also come in diploid or tetraploid, that's the number of chromosomes that they have. And as you might guess, a tetraploid has twice as many chromosomes as a diploid, and you end up with a much bigger plant. This one on, the, on, my, on, the, on your right side there, that's a typical diploid type flower. Nice looking flower, but relatively small. And the one next to it here is a tetraploid, much larger flowers, much larger, thicker stem. Uh, not necessarily going to be any more flowers per stem, possibly more flowers per stem with a tetraploid, but the whole plant is bigger. It might be twice the size of a diploid plant. And, but there's just, they're all going to be very, very nice flowers. So uh, if you're looking at catalogs, you might see them listed as diploid or tetraploid. That's what they're referring to. Uh, but look at the size of the plant that they mention, and they're all going to do pretty well for us. Again, they like full sun, but they're going to take a little bit of shade. If you've got a little bit of a shady location, they can do fine there too. Uh, they're going to be in bloom for the next several weeks here, and there are some, of course, that are ever blooming or reblooming. Uh, Stella Diero being one of the most common or famous uh, types that we're familiar with. I think Stella Diero has almost gotten overplanted because it's used so much. But in order to keep that ever blooming process going, you really need to get in there and cut those flower heads off after they're done blooming. You'll see little fruit developing on those stems after the flowers have faded. Cut those stems down in the foliage some ways down, and that's going to encourage new flower stems to come up, and you'll get more and more of that reblooming. And we're getting more and more varieties that will give us that reblooming uh, process. But fantastic plants, very durable, uh, tolerate just about all of our soils here in South Dakota. Great plants to have in the garden. Very good. It's that time of the year where color is really starting to show up. In right. Our, the perennials are really coming on and giving us a great show. There's a lot of things blooming at McCroy right now. We've been kind of light on visitors lately with the heat, but mm -hmm. uh, hopefully when things cool down a little bit, we'll, folks will come on back out and start seeing all the things that are going on at McCroy. Now, going back a little bit to the wilt uh, condition that you're talking about, mm -hmm. it's not uncommon at this 
the, well, the midday when the heat is real hot, to have some wilt conditions, that doesn't necessarily mean that it needs water. It's just right. the plant reacting right. at that temperature, isn't it? Correct. That's especially true if you've already been kind of in a saturated situation or we're coming out of some cool, wet weather and then it gets hot. Uh, it takes a while for plants to kind of acclimate to that higher temperature and, and humidity, or the, especially the higher temperature, not so much the humidity. But uh, again, check the soil. If you're not sure if you should water or not, stick the, your finger down there and see if that soil feels moist. If it does, don't water. Uh, you can really cause more damage than good sometimes if the plant doesn't need that water. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mike, we're having perfect weather for weed growth, oh, aren't we? Oh, man, and they just won't die. Yeah. You know, you, you <laughs> dig them up, and then it rains, and then they start growing right back again. I weeded my garden here a while ago, and you never would have guessed it because all those weeds, I didn't remove them, and they just came back right up. So frustrating. And in the yard as well, and there's some weeds showing up in the yard. Uh, I've noticed in my yard, yard around campus here, some of those grasses are starting to show up now. Uh, one of them is crabgrass, and I've got some pictures here. Uh, this is what you might be seeing out there, these little patches of crabgrass coming up, lighter colored than the rest of your turf, um, and kind of showing up usually on the edges or compacted soils, that sort of thing. But crabgrass showing up. Next picture, you know, sometimes people wonder, is it crabgrass, is it quackgrass? We can identify crabgrass as one of the only grass species you'll have in your yard that has hairs all over it, uh, on the top of the leaf, on the bottom, on the stem, little hairs all over. And so we'll be seeing that around right now. Now control at this time is difficult. There are products out there. Uh, you, you might see things that are like Weed Be Gone plus crabgrass control, the Bear Advance products plus crabgrass that will contain the product Quinclorac. And that's something you can spray on the crabgrass foliage. Uh, it takes a couple weeks. It might turn purple like we see in the plant here. And then maybe a little bit later, uh, it might die off. These, are, these can be somewhat effective. The best control option is wait till next spring and use a pre-emergence crabgrass preventer. Some precautions to take with these Quinclorac products, though, is that they're always mixed with dicamba and 2,4-D, so they're going to be volatile, and those vapors can move into your tomatoes and your potatoes, your ornamentals, so that can cause problems. Also, you don't want to use those grass clippings to mulch your garden. Uh, wait maybe three or four, uh, after three or four mowings before you use those clippings as mulch, because that herbicide can linger, that Quinclorac herbicide can linger on those clippings and get into your garden that way. So. Things to be watching for, like I say, you can use those herbicides for some suppression right now, but really the best way to control it, wait till next spring, and early on, when the lilacs bloom, hit it with a pre-emergence crabgrass preventer. Okay, good. Thank you. Yep. That, they really like to fill in this time of year. You get a little moisture and bare spots, that crabgrass just... Yeah, now they really show up. And if, you're, if you don't want to use the herbicides, you know, you, you can maybe bag those clippings. Pretty soon the, the heads will start coming out. Maybe bag those and, and prevent some of that seed production. Crabgrass is just an annual species, uh, so uh, if you can prevent seed production, that can help uh, minimize uh, populations of now, future. Also, keep that mowing height up, even now mm -hmm. in the middle of summer with the heat on, the, maybe the moisture might turn off eventually. Uh, get that mowing height up, uh, that'll, that'll help uh, suppress that crabgrass as well. So if you mow off the seed heads, will composting, if you have good composting, take away the germination of that seed? Or? Well, it may not. You really got to get that heat up. Uh, and so a larger compost pile may do that, but uh, generally uh, it, it may not. So you want to be a little careful about some of that stuff right. as well. Good. Thank you, Mike. Yep. KC, do we have a wildlife that really like this warm weather? I don't think so. <laughs> Uh, not, not, not very many things really like in terms of wildlife like this hot weather. They, if you if you go out in the middle of the day right now, you'll you you don't hear birds singing and and things look kind of dead. Um, and so they're they're active early, early, early in the morning and and right before dusk, uh, out feeding. And and with this heat, it's really important uh, if you have water uh, water. Uh, uh, baths in your yard to keep them full, keep them clean. They're going to get a lot of use uh, by the by the songbirds in your yard. Uh, likewise, this time of the year now too, I'm noticing, while it has been for the last month, the jelly feeders that I've got out for Orioles uh, are really uh, becoming attractive, uh, not just to the Orioles, but to gross beaks and catbirds and thrashers. Um, and and the, the, the young birds, the young of the year, are starting to come into those feeders, uh, at least at my place. And, and so uh, I'm going through a lot of jelly right now. <laughs> um, 
And uh, a, a little kind of a, a sidebar about Johns, uh, the, the, the grubs, those big grubs, I've, I've had those in my yard too. And boy, when I have them, the woodpeckers will get on those stumps uh, in a hurry and, and dig those big, that's quite a meal, you know, for a woodpecker. <laughs> so. Escargot. Escargot. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Casey. So well, let's get right to the questions because we have quite a few that are coming in. Uh, the first two here, Dave, talk about uh, watering that you, you mentioned. Does watering during the heat of the day shock or harm the plants, whether it's flowers or vegetables? You hear that sometimes, well, my water's too cold or wet, will that shock the plant? The other one is uh, they normally water their garden one time per week, give it a good soaking, but how often should they water now, this time of the year, and how can I tell when to water? So. Well, we often get that question about watering during the heat of the day. Uh, one thing to certainly keep in mind is that you're going to lose more of your water when you apply it during the heat of the day because it's going to evaporate. So you're not going to be as efficient using your water if you, if you water during that time of the day. As far as shocking the plants, I don't think that's really an issue other than the fact that if you've got that hose laying out there in the sun and that first water that comes out, that can be pretty hot water. You can get some damage from that. But the, the cool water... Hitting the, the hot plants is actually going to help cool the plants off a little bit, and it's really not going to cause any problems there as far as stressing the plants out or anything. But it's better if you can water early in the morning or wait till things kind of cool off and do it in the evening. But morning watering is typically the best thing to do as it gives plants a chance to dry off before they go into the evening. We've got, you know, create good conditions for disease con uh, problems if we have plants going wet in, into the dark period. So early morning is the best time to water. As far as how often to water, again, generally plants need about an inch of water per week in your garden. And if you haven't had any rainfall, that's a pretty good rule of thumb to, to take. And if you've got a pretty good loam soil that holds its water fairly well, watering once per week is probably still going to be a pretty good bet. Uh, again, you're going to see some stress, see some wilting maybe during the heat of the day these days. But uh, check that soil, take a trowel, dig down. If it seems like there's moisture several inches down, you're probably okay yet. Okay, good. And that once a week actually helps develop root systems, doesn't right. it? Right. Uh, yeah, if you water real frequently, and especially with turf, uh, that's a very common mistake that a lot of people make. They water every day for like 15 minutes. And you can keep the lawn really green and lush that way, but if you look where the root development is, it's all very shallow. And if for some reason your watering system quits on you or they put watering restrictions on or your power goes off or whatever, and you miss watering for a couple of days, your lawn can go brown and get really stressed out and get a lot of thatch development during that process of watering very frequently all the time too. So once a week is a good rule of thumb to take for watering just about any of your uh, landscape type plants. Okay. Well, I have you on uh, home plate here, Dave. We're going to give you a couple more. Uh, one from Sioux Falls and one from Gettysburg. They sound very similar as far as the cost or the issue that they have or the concern. Uh, the first one is blossom and rot on zucchini or squash. They water every day at the same time using soaker hoses. What could be wrong? The one from Sioux Falls, they planted the zucchini early June. It, nice, good plants. The fruit gets about three inches long and then wilts and dries up and falls off. Any idea what may be the problem? And well, I, I assume they're kind of similar, but maybe they're not. Well, you mentioned blossom and yeah. rot, and we typically think of that more with tomatoes and peppers. We can see a similar problem with cucurbits like that, but I think maybe what we're seeing is something relating to that, that John can help us out with, maybe just not getting good pollination out there. I would guess that that's the case right now. Um, it sounds to me like things just weren't completely pollinated, if you will. It was enough to maybe start some of those things and uh, not enough for them to continue the development of it. It may be a case where the plant is producing the surrounding fruit on that, but it doesn't have full seed development inside and so it simply aborts producing that fruit on there uh, since there's no viable seed in it and, and it just falls off. Okay. So I just give things time and I think as the temperatures cool off maybe that's going to be, is that, how do temperatures affect the pollinators? Is it too hot for pollinators too? A lot of them prefer not to be out in those really hot humid conditions but um, you know it's one of those where things are a little bit off on schedule this year and some of our our bee pollinators that are out on those cucurbits are just appearing now, and so the earlier ones may not have gotten pollination from some of those well, common. I think also the high temperatures decrease the pollination period where the flowers are viable for pollinations, and the flowers just wilt faster, so I don't think 
those bees got to get in there and do their thing at the right time or it's not, you're not going to get uh, pollination and that little fruit is going to wilt up and die. Many of those plants only produce nectar for a very short period of time mm -hmm. in those flowers. It may be as short as, for some of them, half hour mm -hmm. during the day. And when it's not there, pollinators won't visit that flower. There's no reward for them, and so they just simply don't go there. And it could be something like that, that that's compressing that time that the plants are producing nectar in there. No reward for pollinators, and pollinators aren't going to those flowers. So if it's not pollinated properly, the plant kind of aborts that. That fruit. Right. Okay. Uh, John and Dave here, perhaps. A 30 year old hackberry tree. Half of the leaves are gone. Holes in the leaves. Seems to be a bug problem, possibly. Uh, but they dry up and they, they look dead. Uh, any idea what might be causing that? We do see some leaf drop problems with hackberries sometimes. I'm not exactly sure what the cause is. Uh, we can also see some leaf drop during this time of the year with certain kinds of trees just from stress, uh, the heat stress, uh, some of the drought stress, or in some cases too much water. Uh, the tree is just trying to reduce some of its uh, evaporative loss by losing some of those extra leaves that it has. And Hackberries seem to be pretty prone to doing that occasionally, and I, I'm guessing that's probably what's going on. The holes in the leaves, I think, might just be kind of incidental. I suspect so. We have some caterpillars that get yeah. into them, but most of those are early in the season and are usually done by first part of June, middle of June. And, and at this time of year, we're not seeing much for caterpillars feeding on those leaves. And anything else that eats hackberry leaves isn't likely to take that much out of them. So right. I suspect it's either leftover damage from one of those caterpillar outbreaks earlier this season or else it's uh, leaf tattering due to environmental conditions. Okay. Aberdeen, Mike. Uh, they have a vegetable garden. Crabgrass is around it. The question is, if I spray early on, around May 1st, will that harm the vegetables? Will spray ar uh, around it, not in the garden, uh, will that carry over? Yeah, well, um, you know, so we always talk about, you know, crabgrass preventers early in the spring uh, before it emerges. And so that, then you're using a, kind of a residual herbicide. Um, there are some residual herbicides for gardens that are effective on grasses like preen. Uh, but a lot of times we kind of uh, advise people to kind of stay away from some of those things, you know, or, or at least be very cautious of using some of these pre-emergence herbicides like preen. Because although they may be tolerant for some of your vegetable crops, not all of them. You know, like corn, for example, uh, your sweet corn may be damaged, things like that. There may be carryover. And, and if you uh, have a different crop on that area next year, you could have some damage. So some of those things that we really kind of have to watch for. Uh, you know, really crabgrass, the best thing for crabgrass is a, is a good mulch. We want to we shoot for maybe three to four inches thick. Uh, those are the types of things we, we can really, um, we can suppress some of those annuals uh, pretty easily with, with a mulch and then we can avoid some of those herbicide applications and some of the injuries that might be associated with that. Okay. Uh, we have another question that came in during the week and we encourage our, our viewers to go ahead and email or fax or, or mail us questions and this is one we have a couple of uh, illustrations on here, pictures on that. And this one comes to us, I'm going to say, well, we don't have the town on this particular one. Two pictures. They're wondering what kind of weed or grass it is. Someone said it was crabgrass, but I always thought crabgrass came when the lilacs bloom. Is it crabgrass or quack grass? Do you know how to get rid of it without pulling it? Uh, it is lighter green than the rest of the regular grass and seems to grow mostly around the edges of the yard. Yeah, and I, I honestly, I didn't even know this question was coming until just before the program. And so my topic of the day was crabgrass, and this is exactly what we were talking about. So, yeah, it's crabgrass. It has a little hairs all over the leaf surface, the stem. That's one way we can identify it. Uh, it'll have a kind of a, a fibrous root system, not much of a root system because uh, it's an annual. So that will differentiate it from quackgrass, which quackgrass is a perennial, will have a much stronger root system. Um, so, you know, if you have these small patches, you know, maybe some of these post-emergence herbicides might work, but again, you got to watch out for the volatility issues and things like that. So you can suppress it with some of those post-emergence crabgrass herbicides. Watch out for volatility. Want to use them maybe on a cooler day, not this 90-degree weather we're having. Uh, it will vaporize like crazy under these hot conditions. So spot treatments, limited areas. 
But next year, remember where you have it, next year maybe go after it with a pre-emergence crabgrass preventer when the lilacs bloom. This stuff did emerge when the lilacs bloom uh, or, shortly, or shortly before the lilacs bloomed, but you just can't see it until now because it starts off as such a small seedling. And that's why a thick turf can really suppress the crabgrass because it starts off as such a small seedling and it really doesn't even show up until now. Okay. We had another uh, question that came in from Hoven, and this is about a tomato transplants uh, that are dead. They seem to have wilted away after the main stem turned brown and looked strangled. Uh, and we do have some illustrations, some pictures here to show. Uh, there are varieties that are supposed to be wilt resistant, like Early Girl and Champion. They're in uh, north central Potter County. Our se growing season so far has been wetter, cooler than usual. Uh, might a too big a dose of nitrogen cause or intensify this problem? Or can they blame it on the weather? Anything they can do to help maybe the rest of the plants from dying out? Well, the fact that they mm. mention a higher dose of nitrogen leads me to question how much they did put on. <laughs> maybe you say, well, did I put too much on? Well, I don't know how much you really did put on. If you've, if you've scattered it right around the base of the plants, that certainly can be enough to burn that stem if it comes in contact with the stem, or even if the soil gets a high enough salt content in it, it can damage roots and cause some damage to the stem as well. But I think we're probably also dealing with some weather effects here, so you're kind of off the hook a little bit, I think. Uh, if the soil is too wet, we certainly have conditions where we can get some fungal growth and issues like that going on with the stem. I don't know for sure what particular disease or pathogen this might be, but when you get the stem turning black like that, uh, you know, I'd say it's a good, a good possibility that you've got some fungal or bacterial pathogens going on there. If Larry was here, he'd probably know just what the answer was. If we could get a look at a sample, uh, a real sample, that might help us to be able to identify that. Uh, if you did put a lot of fertilizer on, the only thing that's going to be able to take care of that is really time and, and moisture to kind of leach some of that nitrogen out of the soil. That's going to take a while for that to happen. So if you put too much on, you might have some more of this. Don't know what else you can really do as far as the disease side other than just kind of hope things dry out a little bit. Okay. The next one comes from the same location uh, in Hoven. Uh, this is uh, between Gettysburg and Hoven, uh, Potter County. And the illustration we have here or the picture is would a cutworm sever a winter squash plant at the base like the picture shows? Uh, if that's not likely, then what else would be doing that? Well, cutworms certainly will sever plants at the base like this under some conditions. This plant, to me, looks like it may be to a size already that I wouldn't expect cutworm damage to do this. Um, I might actually suspect uh, something a little larger than a cutworm, something along the lines of a, a small mammal maybe uh, taking a bite out of this. Um, or it could just simply be mechanical damage, I think, and uh, it's, there's a possibility anyway although it would be a little bit early for it, that you could have uh, squash vine borers get into those and weaken that stem right at the base and it could snap off in a wind. But on this one, I would honestly suspect small mammal first. Quite a cager on that thing, though. Yeah. Looked like it was open on one side. <laughs> well, and I, I think uh, I, I've had similar issues and, and 13 line ground squirrels yes. uh, were, were the culprits. And so that, that would be my best guess there okay. as well. And I, I don't think this is the case here, looking at the other plant that was in the picture, because uh, it looked fairly healthy. Uh, but I've seen where you get a real windy day, if it's sandy soil, well, that'll just sandblast it right at the soil surface and weaken that to where it just kind of breaks off. Right. And I mentioned, you know, squash vine borers, they tunnel through the center of that stalk and it weakens the stalk. Get a wind and a little twisting on there, sometimes they can actually twist them right off there, too. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're a bit early for that. I, over the last uh, about 10 days, two weeks now, I've seen them laying eggs, but I haven't encountered any large larvae and vines at this point yet. Okay. So I think it's a little early for that yet. Right. Brookings, when can I cut my peony bushes down? I wouldn't cut them down until they freeze this fall. So you got a little time to wait there. Uh, if you want to do any cutting on them at all, if you've got the old flower stalks there with the seed heads developing, you can give those a snip down to where the first leaves are below that. That's going to improve the appearance of it, but I would strongly encourage you to not cut that foliage down until it has a chance to mature this fall. Okay, and the second part to their question, or another question from the same individual, is it okay to cut the suckers off a dwarf fruit tree at this time? 
Actually, now is a pretty good time to remove those suckers. <clears throat> if you remove them during the middle of the summer, right now, they don't tend to grow back as easily as if you remove them in the spring. So cut them down as close to the base of the tree as you can without damaging the trunk of the tree. You don't want to do that. But cut those off now, and that's going to get rid of them for a while, but they're probably going to come back again. Okay. Uh, John, this comes from Winter. Grasshoppers. How safe and effective is organic grasshopper bait, naturally occurring fungus? Is what they they have here. Uh, are there other and then are there any other good methods that you would suggest for controlling grasshoppers? Well, I don't have a lot of experience with the the bait products like that. Um, you know, honestly, the uh, the advantage to this is that you could consider them to be relatively safe. Uh, most of those fungal pathogens will only affect the target organism, in this case, the grasshoppers, and it's a bait product, so you're not spreading it all over everything. It's, it's concentrated just in those baits. With some of these sorts of things, grasshoppers have a better sense of taste than people give them credit for. And unless they're pretty hardly pushed to eat something, they may not want to eat that bait. They may eat your garden first and leave the bait alone. I've seen that happen in some cases. I um, was actually involved in some research work where we were looking at fungal pathogens for grasshoppers. And in that case, in, at least with one particular fungus, they would rather starve than eat the fungus. Uh, so you may find that you have some of that going on. As far as control then, you know, really you're down to trying to either sacrifice some of the garden, maybe some outside plantings to the grasshoppers, or else putting a conventional synthetic insecticide on against them. Okay. And the barrier around that garden might be a good place to treat if they don't want to actually have to treat in right. the garden? Right. Yeah, you can actually uh, put a barrier around it. Most of the time the grasshoppers won't come out in the garden. They move into the garden from other areas, and so you could spray around the outside and hopefully get them before they get into the garden and do too much damage. Okay. Thank you. Well, Garden Line went on location with SDSU Wildlife and Fishery Science Professor Casey Jensen. We learned which plantings attract songbirds and why. I'm Casey Jensen, an assistant professor in the Department of Wildlife and Fishery Sciences at South Dakota State University. And I want to spend a few minutes today talking about plantings that you can put in your yard specifically to attract uh, songbirds. Uh, one choice that's particularly good here is a hawthorn. Um, you can see here it has some uh, fairly substantial uh, thorns that offer protection for nests that birds may make in your yard. And also, uh, the hawthorn provides some fruits that persist uh, throughout the year and will provide a good winter food source for birds. Uh, if you have young children, uh, hawthorn might be something you want to uh, consider not planting because of the, the danger that these thorns may, uh, uh, may offer uh, young children. There are some other uh, shrubs as well that provide food and cover, uh, and we can uh, go look at a few of those as well. Okay, here are some uh, examples of vines that are, are good plantings for birds. They provide, uh, in the case here of the river grape, provides both cover and food. You can see some developing grapes here that will uh, be good, a good food source, particularly in late summer and fall. And the vines of both the river grape and this five-leafed example, the woodbine, uh, offer good nesting cover uh, for birds. And the, and the vines also make attractive cover around your, your yard. Uh, the, again, these are very good plantings for, to attract birds to your yard. Um, this is a mountain ash. This is a, a really good choice for planting it for a tree in your yard. You can see it has uh, a nice fruiting body here, and these are very attractive and, and turn bright orange in the fall, and they persist through the winter and are uh, used by birds for food. Uh, other tree species would include the red mulberry and the hackberry, which would be good choices for, uh, for trees that provide both cover and food. Uh, mulberries can make a mess in your yard, and particularly around your driveway, so you might want to consider that. Some native plant choices that would be good would be wild plum and chokecherry, but in small yards they may not be appropriate because they tend to sucker and form uh, clumps that could easily overtake a small area. But in larger yards or farmsteads, they're a very good choice. There are 
Uh, many, many bir uh, plants that can be used to attract birds, and lots of them are outlined in, in this publication put out by the uh, South Dakota Department of Game, Fish, and Parks on uh, sharing your space with wildlife that offers good suggestions for wildlife plantings. Well, thank you for that information, Casey. So it's always You're interesting. Welcome. So good. Uh, and we're going to go back to some of the the uh, pictures and questions that came in over email. And this one here, Dave, or anybody that wants to chime in, and that is, they lost all the tags from their plants that we have here. Is there any chance you can identify these plants? I greatly appreciate the time and wisdom that you folks have. Well, I took a look at the pictures, and here again, especially on the one, having a, a, a real plant sample might help us out. But this first one I'm pretty confident in. This looks like it's swamp milkweed. Uh, it's a, related to the butterfly weed that some people plant. This is related also to the uh, milkweeds that you might see growing around in the ditches and so forth. It's actually kind of a nice plant. It's got a pretty good looking flower. And it usually is perennial for us. The flowers are usually pink, but they can also be white. And you might find some hybrids that are available that are not quite as hardy that might have orange to red colored flowers. In fact, I saw some uh, monarch butterfly caterpillars feeding on a couple of them in the McCrory yesterday. So a, a pretty decent plant, very easy to grow. It's one that can kind of spread around your yard. They'll get the milkweeds flower or, or seed pods on them just like the other milkweeds do which can be very attractive, but that seed gets floating around with our winds here, and you'll soon see them popping up in other areas of your garden, which isn't a real terrible thing. Uh, the other one, a little more difficulty in identifying this one, my first guess is that this is Horiolissum, which is actually an annual uh, plant that I looked in the weed book, and it sounds like it can be found in this area of the state, but it's not typically a perennial plant that you would buy. So I'm not positively sure of this one. I think there were a couple other images there. Maybe Mike can get a better look at it. But uh, typically we think of this as more of a weed out in like pastures and that sort of thing. So I'm not really sure on what this one is. But uh, here, again, a plant sample or a closer image of the flowers and the leaves and so forth. Some of that would help give us a better chance of getting that one identified. Okay. And of course, a weed is only a plant that you don't like. Right. So if it right. looks pretty and you like it, hey, yep. enjoy. But uh, yeah, it's hard to say for sure at this point. So I won't go pulling it yet. Okay. Uh, Casey, this one comes to us from Sioux Falls. Uh, they took this picture of the neighborhood cardinal out their kitchen window. So it's not the clearest. They apologize for that. But what's, she, they want to know what's happening to the cardinal's tuft. Will they be okay? I had one last year in my garden, and he was completely bald. Uh, could this be the same bird? My relatives. <laughs> um, well, it, it could be one of two things here, and, and be, my best guess is that this is uh, something that you're going to see this time of the year. Uh, and in cardinals, it's really evident because they're, they lose their crest. Uh, but they're they're molting. They replace those feathers twice, two times per year, and this is the time of the year when when uh, some of those birds are go starting through that molt. And when they get done with their head, then they'll move down to their back and onto their flanks. And so they they molt different different parts of their body, kind of in sequence. The other thing that could be happening, and and at times happens, is is they'll get an infestation of feather mites. Um, that essentially cause them to itch so much that they they scratch uh, so so much that the feathers come out and usually you can tell if you're at a feeder and looking at it you can see kind of a it looks kind of scabby and and so you can tell if there's a feather mite infestation uh, if that's if that's the issue. Okay. Yep. Uh, this one comes to us from Hot Springs, and it's a series of pictures of uh, evergreens that they have in their yard. Uh, just one branch each, uh, it seems like, in the tree, the four tree, five evergreens, actually. Uh, the one in the yard seems to be moving up the tree. I noticed today that one of the branches has the bark gone with little tiny holes in the branch. I hope these pictures are clear enough to give you a good look at the problem. The four trees are close together, the second one being further away from the garage or patio. I cannot see if the one by the garage has holes in it, however. 
They would hate to lose these, so even though they've had quite a bit of moisture, they indicate that they're not in standing water at all. Um, and do you have any thoughts? What might be the problem and if they can or should do anything? Well, I think I'll give it more of a general uh, guess here is that you're going to lose some branches like that occasionally. And I would just go in there with a, a good hand saw and if you can, reach it from the ground or use a pole saw if you want to try that. But just remove that branch up close to the base of the branch. Don't cut into the trunk of the tree, but just take that branch out and I think you're probably going to be fine. I wouldn't be worried at this point that you're going to lose a whole tree. There are some insects that will feed on, on uh, junipers like this, but if you're just seeing one branch like that, I wouldn't get too overly concerned. Uh, I'm not sure which ones it is in this case, um, and it's kind of that question of which came first, chicken or the egg. In some of these cases with trees like this, you'll get an infestation of an insect, woodpeckers or other birds or sometimes animals will go after them and take the bark off of a branch or off of several branches and taking that bark off will kill that branch and I don't know if that's maybe what happened here. The other possibility is the other way around. The branch died, the insects moved in and then something went after some of those insects or they emerged. A lot of times when you see those holes like that, a number of them have emerged and left already. Okay. Uh, this one comes to us from Brookings. Uh, Every year at this time, my American cranberry bushes show symptoms of this leaf disorder. This problem is displayed on the new leaf tissue only. The older leaves are not affected. Any idea what it is and what they can do to help correct the problem? Uh, the bushes are located on, on the north side of the house, around and under the deck, mostly shaded except for the morning sunlight. This one is actually a fun one because most people will never guess what it is. This is actually a mite that is doing this on these leaves. Produces brilliant red color like you see here at times and, and even some shades of white and some really uh, attractive foliation um, patterns on these leaves in my opinion. As far as what you can do about them, it's pretty hard to do much of anything. You could try using some acaricides, uh, some products that would kill some of those mites, but really it's going to be fairly difficult to to kill those mites and they're not doing any serious harm to to the trees. Um, this is a, a close-up picture here. This is an areophyid mite that is causing this problem. Um, I would say at this point no need to do anything at all. You can just leave them alone. They won't do any significant damage and enjoy the the extra colors added to the shrub. Okay. Uh, we're going to go back to the questions that are coming in tonight now. I, got a, I have a whole series of tomato ones here, Dave, so we're going to hit those. Uh, from Lennox, tomatoes are wilting because the soil is too hot, perhaps. Direct sunlight and big boys are what they are. Uh, that's all the information we got on that particular one. Well, as I said earlier, this is a good time to check that soil. Dig down and around with your fingers or carefully dig, not real close to the plant, but just dig in the area of the plant to see if that soil still has some moisture in it. If it seems like it's really dry, get that soaker hose out or get the irrigation going on those plants to give them some extra water. Um, again, as we talked about earlier, during the heat of the day we can also see just some wilting. Um, on the other hand, we could also have situations where it's been too wet and we're getting some root loss and that's causing the plant not to be able to take up enough water. So you got to really check out that soil to see what's going on and then go from there. Uh, putting some mulch around those plants is going to also help to retain some of that soil moisture and keep the soil a little bit cooler. That's going to help reduce some of the stress on that root system, make it a little bit more effective also. Okay. This one comes from Woodstock, Minnesota. Their tomatoes are not setting uh, and no flowers. Well, uh, and it's Heartland, Early Girl, and Pink Girl are okay. the varieties, if that makes any difference. Uh, some of the phone volunteers kind of cornered me as I came up the stairs and said, no, true or false, if it's too hot, tomatoes aren't going to set fruit. And actually, if it does get too hot, uh, you aren't going to get very good fruit set for several reasons, especially if it's hot during the evening. Uh, the flowers tend to abort, and you just don't get good pollination during the heat of the day uh, or when those flowers are open. Uh, tomatoes can be self-pollinated, but they are also pollinated by wind and, and insects going into them and so forth. Uh, so there's a lot of things that go on there in the physiology of tomatoes and, and again just hot stressful conditions like they're going through right now is going to reduce the chances of having fruit sets. So just bide your time a little bit, make sure that they aren't getting water stressed and when things cool off a little bit I think you'll see more flowers coming on and hopefully some fruit setting on. Okay, This one's from Hartford. Tomatoes, how to water, high or low at the roots? I'm not, I'm not sure if you want yeah. to. 
hold the water in can up here, you hold the water in can yeah. low, I'm not sure, but uh, you want to saturate that root zone when you water. So check to see if the soil needs it. If it does, saturate that root zone. That's going to be the top six inches of soil or so at least. Uh, you want to water thoroughly and then don't water again until things start to dry out. So that's could you, a could good you general minimize, rule. Could you minimize some of that disease risk right. by soaker hose versus yep. a sprinkler? Yep. Uh, using a soaker hose or watering from below uh, is going to help keep that foliage dry. That's going to reduce some of the disease problems that we've talked about in, in previous shows and previous years. Uh, it's also a good way to conserve water because you're not spraying it up in the air and losing a lot of it to evaporation. So. I guess if it's high or low, I guess watering low is, is the best answer there. Yeah, keeping it off the leaves if you're right. possible, and that splashing up on the Correct. leaves if you can. The second part is, should she pick the blossoms off to encourage larger fruit or more production on the ones that are already starting to set? Well, if you have a lot of fruit setting on one particular branch or truss of the tomato, if you reduce the future number of tomatoes on there, you're going to probably see some increase in size of those of those fruit. I guess it's up to you if you want to extend the harvest season a little bit or if you're going for some really big showstopper tomatoes that you're going to take to the fair or achievement days. If you got some good fruit set on them, sure, go ahead and pick some of those flowers off to encourage those tomatoes to get even bigger. That's probably not a bad idea, but most people want to get all the tomatoes they can get, so it's up to you what balance you want to strike there. Okay. Uh, Mike from Madison, tree seedlings growing in their lawn. They mow them off, but they keep coming back. They seem to come back every year, maybe even a little thicker. Uh, they sprayed in the fall. It didn't seem to help at all. Is there something that you can spray for that? Uh, when should they be bagging the clippings? Ash and maple trees uh, seem to be the trees that are nearby. Yeah, yeah. So they're coming up, yeah, now. And, uh, you know, still, I know you haven't had much luck with the mowing, but that is a pretty good standard approach. Uh, sooner or later, they'll kind of give up. And, you know, raise that mowing height up again, like we mentioned for the crabgrass. That also will help kind of uh, compete with some of those uh, tree seed, those small tree seedlings that are popping up. And eventually, they'll give up. Uh, there are some sprays available. Uh, perhaps one option uh, might be, um, it's, it's called We Be Gone for Clover, Chickweed, and Oxalis. Uh, triclopyr is the chemistry you might be looking for. That one won't volatilize uh, like your 2,4-D type chemistry. So uh, We Be Gone for Clover, Chickweed, and Oxalis. It's not real common. Sometimes you'll see it around. You might have to hunt for it. But again, my standard recommendation would just be to keep on mowing it, maybe raise that mowing height up three inches, three to four inches, something like that, uh, and that ought to at least suppress those and, and kind of hide them within that thick turf. Okay. John, Sioux Falls, and I assume this has happened, the fact they sent the question in, is it too early to be hearing the cicadas? Oh, not at all. It was one that I actually thought about as uh, our initial topic for the evening. Uh, actually, I heard the first cicada that I heard this year on July 2nd, and I kind of made note of that because every once in a while you hear people who will say that it's however many weeks, different people have different numbers from when you hear the first one until the first frost. And my argument to that is always that you probably don't hear the first one and everybody hears something different. So I'm not sure how you determine that, but um, I did make note of that. I heard the first one that I had heard this year on July 2nd. They're actually in full swing right now. The males are out singing, trying to attract females, and, and uh, you should hear them, especially late in the days. Okay. Uh, David, best time to transplant peonies? Well, this gets back to the question we had earlier about cutting back the peonies. Uh, the best time is to wait until fall. September is the ideal time to do that. Uh, it's going to give the plant a chance to get some roots established and also the foliage is matured and, and uh, is stored up as much carbohydrates as you can. So if you can, hold off until September. If you've got to move them earlier than that because you're changing locations or something like that, you can move them earlier in the season, but it's going to be more stressful on the plants. You're probably going to want to cut that, those stems back about halfway or so after you dig them out and transplant them. The most crucial thing is to look at where the, the depth of how, the, how deep those, rise, or those roots are and especially any buds that might be developing down at the base, those buds should be about an inch below the soil surface when you replant them. Okay. This one comes to us from Sioux Falls. Suggested, they want to know a suggestion on how to get rid of Creeping Charlie that has taken over the renter's grass. Oh, sure. Yeah. Right. Yep. 
Small purple flowers, I guess, is what they wrote on there, kind of indicating that that's why they think or feel it's Creeping Charlie. So. Yeah, you know, some of the most potent herbicides for Creeping Charlie right now are some of those that have the greatest risk of volatility. So not a lot you can do. It's a perennial. And so like most of our perennials, fall is going to be the best time uh, if you're going to control it. Very tough weed, not very sensitive to herbicides. Uh, so you're going to be looking at maybe two applications in the fall starting in September and then another one maybe in two to three weeks after the first. That's going to be the best and it's going to be a multiple year approach. In the meantime, you're going to want to try to thicken up that turf, maybe get in some shade tolerant turf species in there. There's a lot of creeping red fescues, a lot of nice fescue species that look just like your Kentucky bluegrass that can look pretty decent. Uh, so you're going to want to kind of maintain that and try to get that grass a little bit more competitive. And again, raising that mowing height up, maybe around three inches, pretty good even for Creeping Charlie uh, to, com to help compete with some of that. So kind of using multiple approaches there. Uh, it's a tough weed and uh, the herbicide thing is, is going to be marginal at best and it's going to be a long-term process. So don't get your hopes up too high, but with continuous management, maybe you can eventually knock that stuff back. Okay. This one comes from Scotland and Dave and uh, Mike here. Uh, cherry, apple, and apricot trees. Uh, fruit trees were sprayed with 2,4-D. Will this affect them permanently? So I don't know if they got the sprayer mixed up or mislabeled or, but. Well, it won't help, <laughs> yeah, that's, for, that's for sure. I guess it depends on, on what kind of rate was applied. Uh, if it was just a standard rate and they just got a little, a little whiff of it, probably not too serious damage if they got doused with it because you thought you were spraying them for apple maggots or something and maybe you put in twice as much as you should have then you're going to have more long-term damage you might see some twig die back that sort of thing uh, you know we always talk about eating the fruit when something is misapplied like that i wouldn't suggest you eat the fruit if they have any fruit on them this year you have to watch that foliage next year if it looks pretty normal then you're probably going to be okay again to start eating the fruit but how much damage you get depends on how much they got uh, dosed yeah. with it. Yeah, that's right. I mean, some of those uh, brush pieces can be fairly resilient, and so just keep watching on it. Watch those buds. You want to make sure those buds stay green here into fall and make sure that uh, the, at least the, stem, the new stem tissue stays green. Um, so just kind of keep watching. It. Don't give up on it yet. It may come back next year, so you may be in luck. But uh, yeah, that's that's a difficult situation. And we're in that drift season. I had a long conversation with a person today who got drifted on from a field. 2,4-D was applied or a similar type herbicide. Really decimated the garden and the trees. Very concerned about that stuff. So yeah, we're in that time period. And, and if you do get the drift in your garden, yeah, generally we do avoid it. We, we do recommend avoiding eating some of that produce. One good thing, I guess, this time of year, the apple, har apple foliage has hardened up quite a bit, so it's not as bad as if you had sprayed it, say, two months ago. But you're still going to probably see some damage. Yep. You're just going to have to sit back and wait and see what happens. Right. Okay. Chancellor, <clears throat> John, I think this is basically what you talked about as far as our round table. Large beetles on grapevines, tan with spots, never had them before. Yeah, these are, I would guess, almost certainly those spotted pellet nodids. Um, they don't have a better common name than that, and I apologize for that. The scientific name is Pelidnota punctata. It's almost as easy as the common name. Uh, they are more common this year than they were in the past. They've been uh, getting more common here. If you go back in the records of insect collections 15 years ago, there were only a handful of them that had ever been collected in South Dakota. With uh, more trees being grown here, larger stumps now rotting and giving them a place to live as larvae, and more grapevines being grown, it gives them more habitat, more food to live in, and and, uh, and so I think we're seeing increasing numbers of them every year in these areas. Okay, this one comes to us from Rapid City. It's aphids on potentellas uh, and other bushes. Is there a less toxic chemical that can be used and less expensive? Uh, they're depending on volunteers to help with the control of these. It's located at a school and they're concerned about the children. And they have kind of a soap project or soap product with parentheses question mark by it as far as if that would work. So. Right. Well, I think first thing here it would help to actually have either good images of these or actual specimens that would come in for identification. Most aphid species are host specific and they won't switch from one host to another. And so if you have aphids on potentilla and that's it, it very likely could be aphids. If you're finding the same thing on a wide range of shrubs, 
you may not really be dealing with aphids. It may be a different type of insect, but um, definitely look at one of the, uh, even the ground drench type products. They have systemic insecticides that you mix with some water, pour on the soil, it's taken up through the plant and affects these insects that way. Uh, you avoid a lot of exposure to people that way and um, far more effective on some of these pests than, than some of the contact type insecticides will be. Okay, thank you. And that's all the time we have for this evening. Just to let you know, Garden Line repeats twice each week on South Dakota Public Broadcasting Digital Channel 3, also known as the Create Channel. The Encore broadcast can be seen Fridays at 11 a.m. Central and Saturdays at 4 p.m. Central. Check your local listings to find SDPB Digital Channel 3 where you live. Now time to wrap up, and thanks to our panel of experts. John Keekafer, Brookings County Extension Educator, David Graper, Extension Horticulturalist, Mike Mechnine, Extension Weed Specialist, and KC Jensen, SDSU Wildlife and Fisheries Sciences. Thanks to our phone volunteers, the folks from the Minnehaha Master Gardeners, and thanks to you for watching and calling in. On behalf of the entire crew, have a good evening and happy gardening. Funding for Garden Line is provided in part by your membership and the Friends of South Dakota Public Broadcasting. And by Swiftel Communications.